Ready, guys? This is module 22. Okay, so let's start with what is light. So light is energy that travels in the form of waves. And the way the wave is kind of determines what we perceive. So the shape of the waves influences what we see. Now, a wavelength is the distance from the peak of one light or sound wave to the peak of the next. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like in the next page. Um, but basically, the wavelength, the distance from the peak of this one to the peak of the next one um, in a single wave, that's what's going to determine the color that you see. The amplitude or the height of the wave determines the intensity, so its brightness. Now, there is a very large spectrum of electromagnetic energy that we can only see this tiny little portion right here. Gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet rays, we are not, uh, we do not have receptors that are able to see that. Same thing with infrared, radar, broadcast bands, though they're too large. So we can only see light waves with a frequency of a little less than 400 uh, nanometers and a little more than 700 nanometers. So it's a very, very limited range that humans have. So if you look at this image, um, if it's a short wavelength, okay, meaning there's not a lot of space in between the two peaks, that would be a high frequency. These are bluish colors. Short wavelengths, bluish colors. Um, long wavelengths or low frequency, meaning it's a they're they're not happening as frequently, as well as there's a greater gap in between the peaks. This would produce a reddish color. Now, the larger the wave, see the height. This will be a brighter color than this, which will have a duller color because the the height is shorter. Okay, now eye structures. We're going to talk about all of these, refer back to this slide for um, detailed imaging of the eye and its structures. Okay, so on the outer layer, if I were to touch your eye, I would likely be touching the cornea. So the cornea is the eye's clear protective outer layer and it covers the pupil and the iris. The first place that light's going to enter is through the cornea. Next up, is the pupil, which is the little black spot in your eye, this, okay? The pupil is a small adjustable opening in the center of the eye through which light passes. So um, the pupil can move because it's kind of like a camera lens. It's gonna wanna either take in more light so it will get bigger or it can get smaller. Um, the iris is a ring of muscle tissue, so the colored part in your eye, or this part, that's the iris. And the iris actually has a job, it's not just to look pretty, the iris's job is a muscle. And the muscle basically will either constrict the pupil or dilate the pupil. Um, then we have, so we, we have our cornea, our iris, our lens, our pupil. We're at the lens now. So the lens is the transparent structure. So it sits behind the pupil. Okay, so here's our pupil, here's our lens. The lens basically helps us to focus images. Just like a lens of a camera does, it focuses. That's what the lens in our eyes do. And then at the very back of the eye, there's a layer of cells um, that contain light sensitive cells. And this is where this is where transduction occurs in the eye, so the transformation of light wave energy into neural impulses. Um, and it has very sensitive special cells called rods and cones. And then it also has specialized cells that we'll talk about more in a moment. So try to test yourself here. Try to see if you can label these parts of the eye. Okay, now the lens. Now. So remember, the lens is that clear part that allows us to focus. So that focusing, this is what we call accommodation, the focusing of the light rays. Um, so the lens will either change its curvature and get like 
tall and skinny or short and fat, depending upon if it wants to focus on something different. Now, there are two different um, eye issues, vision issues, that happen because of the lens. So if you are nearsighted, that means you have myopia. Now, myopia, what's happening is that the lens is not accurately projecting the image onto the retina. So, for example, in a normal eye, the lens is going to project the image right to the focal point of the retina. It's going to want to hit that area. In a person with nearsightedness, it's stopping short of that. And so you can see things that are up close to you because, well, they ha- they're not as further of a distance, but things that are far away are much harder because your, your lens is not working properly to actually get it all the way to the back. Hyperopia is the opposite. If you're farsighted, the light is actually being projected further than the retina, and so it's easy to see things from far away, but when you're looking at something up close, it will look blurry because it's getting too far back from uh, the lens is not directing it correctly, and it's going further than the retina. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the retina. The retina is this layer of cells right here along the back of the eye, and it contains a bunch of different receptor cells, which we'll talk about more, but rods and cones are the ones that are receiving the incoming light waves, and they're going to process them in different waves. So light waves are transduced, that's transduction, into neural impulses by the rods and cones. So we have our rods and cones. So, okay, Light strikes the retina, goes to the very back, okay? The rods and the cones will change this information and send it into a cell called a bipolar cell, meaning it has two poles, okay? The bipolar cell will then send that information to the ganglion cells. The ganglion cells then all bundle together, forming what we call the optic nerve. We're going to talk about this more in class, so don't worry. We're going to go over this in depth. Now, let's talk specifically about rods and cones because these are important. So rods are the photoreceptors in the retina that detect black, white, and gray, and they are sensitive to movement. Your rods are in your peripheral vision, meaning they're on the outside of the eye, like they're on the periphery of the eyeball. And they're necessary for peripheral vision as well as twilight vision. When you see in the dark, you can't see color because color are processed by cones. The only thing working in the dark are your rods. And they remain sensitive in dim light. Now, one thing that's interesting is that rods do not have any quick hotline to the brain. They share connections to a single bipolar cell, which sends a combined message to the brain. Rods are sensitive to faint light, and if there's movement happening in your peripheral vision, the rods are picking that up. Cones on the other hand, are mainly located in the middle of the retina, in this spot called the fovea. And they do well in daylight, this is when they're sensitive, or well-lit conditions. Your cones are the areas that detect fine detail and color. So if I wanted to know, if I wanted to look at something really well, I'm not gonna look at it over here. That's not where my cones are. I would want to look at it straight on like this because it's hitting the very center back of my eye, which is where my cones are located. Um, Cones are inactive in dim light. You can't see color. Um, And cones have their own hotline to the brain. So one cone will transmit its message to a single bipolar cell, which relays a message to the visual cortex. So cones are... um, Cones are pretty important. Okay, so we have our retina with our rods and cones, bipolar cell and ganglion cells. And in the retina is the fovea. This is the point of central focus. This is where most of our cones are located. We have way more rods in our eye than cones um, because our cones are really pretty much just located right around the fovea. Now, the optic nerve is made up of those ganglion cells, axons, And so the optic nerve is going to take that info away from the eye and send it to the thalamus, 
which will then send it to the occipital lobe. Now, there's this spot right here where the optic disc is, there's the optic nerve leaving the eye and there's no cells right there. And so this creates a blind spot and we'll, I'll show you your blind spot in class together. Okay, so as the impulse then gets sent, sent to the optic nerve, it carries the impulse to the thalamus, like I said, and then that will direct the information to the visual cortex of the occipital lobes. Now, color processing. There are different theories of how we process color. One is the young Hemholtz, AKA the trichromatic theory. Basically, this theory says that we have three different types of cones, and each of them are specifically sensitive to a certain wavelength. One is sensitive to red, oops, one is to green, and one is to blue. And when they're stimulated in combination, they can produce the perception of any color. The trichromatic theory is similar to the idea of how we produce color on a TV. Um, it's a mixing of two different wavelengths that could create a color like purple, for example. Um, color blindness relates to this because when a person is colorblind, it typically is because they are lacking or have a defective cone. So either their red cone, their green cone, or more rarely, their blue cone is not working properly. So if you have a, let's say you have a defective red cone, it's going to be hard for you to tell the difference between red and green because they're all stimulating about the same. So you're not going to notice much of a difference. So this is what this would look like to someone with red green color blindness. Also with color blindness, males are much more affected because the gene is sex linked, meaning it's carried on the X chromosome. And since males only inherit one, if they inherit just one copy of the gene, they will inherit it. For a female to get color blindness, they have to inherit two copies of the gene. Um, and then there's the opponent process theory that cone photoreceptors are paired together. So red and green, blue and yellow, and white and black. And this allows us to see color vision. So when we stare at red, for example, according to this theory, the green is inhibited. And so we know that we're seeing red because green is being inhibited. So opponent process theory is cool because it helps explain this after images. So what I'm going to have you do is pause the video here, look at this dot for a minute, and then go to the next slide. And then let's talk, we'll talk more in class about what you saw. Now, color processing, how does it work? Basically, both theories are correct. The retinas, red, green, and blue cones do respond in varying degrees to different color stimuli. But the cone's responses also then process the opponent process cells like the opponent process theory proposed. So basically, yes, there's red, green, and blue cones, and they kind of work in combination to create color. But also, the trichromatic theory doesn't explain afterimages like the opponent process theory. So there are opponent process cells that are working in the cones that help to explain that. Okay, feature detection. Um, so feature detectors are nerve cells that are located in the visual cortex of the occipital lobe, and they respond to specific features like edges, lines, certain angles, and movements. Now, feature detectors receive information from individual ganglion cells in the retina. They then pass this to other areas in the cortex where supercell clusters respond to more complex patterns. And an example of this is, you know, a soccer player has to use her feature detectors to be able to see the movements, the angles, the lines um, in order to score a goal. Now, parallel processing, oh, wow, okay. Parallel processing is when we think about many aspects of a problem simultaneously, and this is our brain's normal mode. Um, so for example, with vision, 
our brain processes motion, form, depth, and color all independently. And after taking a scene apart, the brain will then integrate these categories into one complete image. That's why you could perceive, you know, like the color someone is wearing as well as how fast they're walking. Those are two independent processes, but they're put together eventually to help you recognize it. Um, this also applies to facial recognition because your brain has to integrate info coming from your retina to several visual cortex areas. Then they have to compare it with stored information. So there has to be some um, accessing of memories, which then allows your fusiform face area in your temporal lobe to recognize the face. This is why that woman, Heather, she could see faces, but she couldn't recognize them because something in her perception wasn't working properly. All right, and test yourself, and we will go over this in depth in class, so do not worry if you feel a little lost. We will definitely cover it more. See ya.